This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. To learn more or to subscribe, visit beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. It's episode 348 of the Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast. Thanks for joining me on this special fermentation-focused episode. Brought to you interruption-free by the yeast and fermentation specialists at White Labs. If you brew beer, you're familiar with White Labs. They've been supplying brewers with the highest quality yeast and fermentation aids for many, many years. And now serve brewers around the world from outposts in San Diego and Asheville in the United States, as well as Copenhagen and Hong Kong. Through today's episode, we'll focus on the keys to effective fermentation from yeast health to enzymes and more. Joining me for this conversation are White Labs founder, Chris White. Welcome to the podcast, Chris. Hello. Thank you. Happy to be here, Jeremy. It's great to have you on and, uh, you know, first time here on the podcast. Also joining me, Beachwood Brewing co-owner, brewmaster Julian Schrago. Welcome back to the podcast, Julian. Jamie, thank you. It's an honor to be here with everybody and I look forward to all the chat. It'll be fun. It'll be fun. And then uh, uh, Russian River head brewer Garrison Fratoni, great to have you on the podcast as well. Hey, Jamie. Uh, super stoked to be here. And a long time listener. Long time. So excited to be here with everybody. I appreciate that. We had a great time hanging out uh, at the uh, Brewers Retreat earlier this year as you were helping make everything happen for us. Um, of course, Russian River and White Labs have a long history together. Um, a couple weeks ago, and I was talking with Vinny Chalurza, who was t- recounting to me stories of street corner yeast pickups back in the very early days of his brewing and your lab, Chris. Um, you know, why don't we uh, why don't we kick things off with a bit of White Labs background? Uh, you know, of course, starting a yeast lab for craft brewers and home brewers was not exactly a safe business bet back when you got into it. Uh, it was certainly a, a labor of love. What drove your interest in yeast and fermentation, and uh, how did how did that evolve uh, into the worldwide business that it is today? Well, I don't I don't think I really knew what I was doing, but I was just trying to homebrew and uh, kept making yeast and kept giving it to people. And then over the years, a business developed out of that. But um, you know, when I first moved to San Diego in 1991, I started uh, homebrewing. Uh, with in 1992 with uh, the people who would end up starting Ballast Point, but uh, they had started a homebrew store in San Diego called Homebrew Mart in 1992. Jack White and then uh, Yusuf Sherde, uh attorney came on and um, popped into the store after they opened, and we uh, just became friends and we started homebrewing. And I was in East Lab. I was working towards a PhD in, in yeast, a uh, yeast called uh, Picia Pastoris, uh, working on uh, really enzyme kinetics, but um, I had a passion for, for beer and brewing. I took some brewing classes as an undergrad at UC Davis. And I just wanted to find out about all grain brewing really was my interest in going in the store. Um, and, uh, but just the way it worked, I started really doing more yeast, uh, cause that was my passion and microbiology and the, what yeast could do to fermentation. Um, and so Yusef and I mostly brewing every weekend we're just trying to make the best beer possible and in in that pathway became the beers for ballast point and the yeast for white labs and of course yeast and brewing it was a it was a different question back then it was a more basic question than uh you know now in terms of range and in terms of understanding of how yeast function in these fermentations um quite a bit more developed it's been that way for a long time yeah right uh so when when i started Homebrewing had really hard access to yeast. So really for me, it was about making my own because that's how I could. So started to acquire strains and and and, and just trying to make better homebrew, not thinking about a, a business plan or a business. It was well before that. Um, like I said, I sort of stumbled into it. But uh, there was, I didn't even know how to start a yeast lab um, or if that was even possible. But uh, uh, on the beer side, I mean, it goes back a long time. When Louis Pasteur uh, said yeast causes fermentation, he didn't think it had anything to do with the beer quality. You know, that kind of came later. Emil Christian Hansen purifying yeast in, in Copenhagen. So now pure yeast, in those words, were about one strain. Now we kind of think, are we talking about no bacteria or no other yeast? I mean, it was really pure. That definition in 1883 was one strain being used to make beer. And, and growing, propagating that one strain up. And so that's where people started saying, hey, yeast, 
the yeast itself can have an impact on the beers. Even though that was what brewers knew, it started making its way into what we do today. And and it's like I said, I'm just saying it goes way back that far. So even now me as in, entering as a brewer and everybody else entering as a brewer, you have that experience where you start using different yeast going, huh, they have a different impact on the beer. Sure, sure. And so, you know, it just kind of grew organically then. And, uh, you know, then you have grown and expanded, created options in the commercial brewing space. And, uh, um, you know, as craft brewing has taken off, uh, grown along with that. Yeah. And Vinny was uh, part of that early San Diego community, uh, starting to homebrew in Temecula at his family's winery, going to homebrew mart, starting a brewery in uh, Temecula. Um, and I, just started supplying him yeast. I'm not really sure how it happened, but he would drive down to San Diego and I would walk down from my, uh, he, well, there was no cell phones, right? So it's about an hour drive. When he got to San Diego, he would call me from the gas station. He'd have to go to a pay phone. <laughs> yeah. Tell me he was there. We didn't think it was any that big a deal at the time, but uh, I would w- walk downstairs and give him some yeast and uh, uh, maybe he'd give me a, a, some, uh, a few bucks um, uh, some of it was trade and other pl- breweries in San Diego, pizza trade at pizza port. But when we knew it was kind of weird was when he asked other people to start picking up the yeast for him and they'd be like, what am I going to do? I'm going to stop at a gas station and call him and it's going to feel like a drug transfer down in the parking lot. But to us, it was just what we had been doing for a, while, a couple of years, you know? So it didn't seem too weird. Perfectly but, normal. It's a little weird now. I love that it's a, you know, it's this story, you know, on the yeast side that parallels the craft beer story, right? Like we couldn't get this beer style and so we have to brew it ourselves. Well, we couldn't get this yeast propagation and so we've got to make it ourselves and that kind of DIY, um, make it happen uh, because no one else is going to make it happen for us. Uh, ethos, you know, still pervades now. Well, um, obviously, you know, the craft beer world is much more developed now. There is, you know, we, you know, in terms of where White Labs is going, I imagine now you're producing more strains than you've ever had in more, you know, different formats, you know, uh, different kinds of ways, all of these things that uh, the brewers need to, you know, achieve highest quality fermentations. Um, you know, what are, you know, maybe we kick off, what are some of the big trends, you know, that you're seeing right now, uh, you know, within, within White Labs? What are um, some of the big things that are starting, that are moving brewers that you all are, are now focusing on, uh, you know, to answer some of that interest? Well, I think for most of, our, all of our, you know, whatever, 30 so year history and, and shorter or longer has been growing capacity. You know, like every brewery I've known has been trying to grow their capacity, add new fermenters. We've been trying to grow. That's why we have the two, the two and three other facilities, um, making yeast, uh, making more strains. Um, you know, the, I think the first different kind of style for us was Hefeweizen, you know, when, that used to be a specialty style. And then all the breweries in the 90s needed heavy bites and yeast. So we, it became a big thing for us. And every new style, even though they're not new, right? But they just something craft brewers are making. And sometimes they're new now, but uh, requires us to kind of invest in new uh, uh, space for new yeast strains. Uh, because if everybody needs them, uh, it, it actually, even if it's only one beer a certain brewery makes, if everybody needs it, it's a lot of yeast for us to make. So we've always just been focusing on on growing more yeast, growing them more healthy, uh, growing uh, just so they can express their best flavors uh, and we can get them to the brewers. Now, it is a little different. Breweries don't have as much capacity expansion. It's like, what can we do to make something that people want to drink? Um, and a lot of that's non-beer right now. So um, we're doing a lot more with dis- uh, yeast for distilling and uh, cider need uh, i think there's still something that hasn't been discovered yet that craft brewers will make that will get big uh maybe some kind of hybrid thing between beer and one of these other styles uh but younger consumers 21 to 25 year olds are you know, just looking for something other than craft beer right now i mean i remember in 2008 being at this um uh, kind of tap room grocery beer to go place in davis california visiting up there we had a lab there for 10 years too um and i was i was in the beer area and two young female students uh, everyone is uc davis student right were where i say where's the pliny 
where's the Pliny? So it's funny for this group. And I'm like, oh, young people are noticing Pliny, young female students. And that was the beginning of 10 years of, of growth because young people noticed craft beer. Um, and they're just not asking maybe for that right now in that age segment. So what are they asking for? And that's kind of what we're trying to focus on for yeast and, and mixed cultures and things what people might need. So you're making more yeast that can ferment hard seltzer right now, or uh, and then also you know the growth of RTDs, which means you know making uh, uh, fermenting that then uh, you know can be distilled into you know neutral base you know for those kinds of RTD beverages. No, you know it's it's, it's something that ever, lots of brewers are are certainly facing out there right now too. However, beer is still a, a pretty strong baseline in that, right? Beer is not going away. Yeah. It's just what can you dabble in right now to to keep your company going and get some growth. Beer plus, beer plus. You know, it's uh, it's still the base on that. Well, you mentioned yeast health, you know, and you propagating yeast at a large scale in order to produce healthy yeast and uh, you know that that's uh, going to perform for brewers uh, viability and help these fermentations is obviously a big piece. Um, talk to me a little bit about uh, you know what that means for you all and how you all have been work working on systems to kind of scale but also produce healthy yeast at a larger scale. Yeah, so I haven't deviated that much since 1995 and how we grow the yeast. Um, 21 day process, small batch. Uh, so what I focused on was just more and more reactors and try to keep them small batch um, because you want to, you know, if we have uh, a bunch of different batches every day coming off, we can keep the viability high, uh, the purity, uh, and um, and a lot of variety of yeast strains. So we don't just make a big batch of yeast and then make another one and then another one. We have, you know, 40 here, 40 there, 40 every day. So, um, and that adds up to all the different strain varieties we have. So that's how I grew our capacity was just bigger and bigger spaces and facilities, but kind of the same production model where a brewery might just go, okay, I'll take my 10 barrel system to a hundred barrel system. I'll put 400 barrel fermenters in and they can scale that way. I didn't really scale that way. I scaled more with square footage and people. Um, lots of parallel, uh, growth fermentation exactly. rather than just, you know, growing the scale of the individual, uh, propagations. Right. Interesting. Interesting. You know, are there specific, uh, uh, you know, yeasts that have driven a lot of growth over the last few years for you? Well, I mean, hazy, you know, make it more London yeah. ale variants, uh, than you've ever done before. Or? Yeah. Our, um, uh, London fog yeast, it, it became a, top seller when we came out with it um uh even more in europe than it is here in the u.s uh and a couple of years ago visiting our copenhagen uh facility they kept giving me hazy after hazy when we go out uh and, and try some beers and i said is there anything else other than hazy beers here and he looked at me and they said isn't that what you guys are drinking in the u.s yeah, but we also have some loggers and we have some, uh, you know, some Belgian styles, you know. So um, uh, it's funny how they, the, the, the styles just tra go all over the world. And uh, uh, so that that had a tremendous impact on, on, I think, everybody's brewery. Everybody started having to make very heavily dry hopped beers in new ways, using new strains or new methods to keep them hazy. Um, and... Uh, it was it was nonstop for a long time. I think something that seemed similar to that in a different way was saisons. When saisons, uh, I don't know, more than a decade ago, I uh, got popular. We were releasing new e strains for saisons. Everybody was making saisons. They were that hazy. They were that Belgian kind of, for lack of a better word, uh, phenolic flavor um, uh, beers coming on. But then that's when hazies got popular. That's when we saw a decrease in the interest in saisons. Interesting. Interesting. And maybe Saison will come back. I keep uh, my fingers oh, crossed. Yeah. I've been tr been drinking more these days, uh, you know, just because it's counter trend. But uh, yeah, we'll see about that one. Well, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, or let's get into the subject of, of healthy fermentation since we're kind of there already at the yeast scale. You know, as, as healthy fermentation transitions into, uh, you know, the commercial brew house, maybe Julian, you can kick off, you know, some of our talk about uh how you set up healthy fermentations, uh, you know, whether that's starting on the hot side before the fermentation ever begins, um, or some of your, you know, pre-prep process, 
uh, as you are getting ready to, you know, set up a healthy fermentation coming in, uh, you know, uh, out of the hot side of the brew house. Talk to us a little bit about your process around that. Some of the things that you focus on and some of the ways that you start setting up those healthy fermentations. Cause it's not just when you load it into the fermentation tank, that healthy fermentation starts even earlier than that. Uh, absolutely. I do want to quickly say I was in Belgium a couple of months ago with my wife and we found almost no saisons available like anywhere. It's a style that has really, really uh, diminished in perhaps popularity, but certainly in production, even in Belgium, uh, they're kind of kind of scarce. But uh, when it comes to yeast health and fermentation, the number one, the first thing that I look at, not the only thing that I look at, but the first thing I look at is cadence and uh, a repitching rhythm and frequency. And in general, um, our house ale yeast, which is White Labs Cal Ale Yeast, uh, in general, that gets repitched every five days on the early end, uh, but and maybe on the eighth or ninth day on the long end. But in general, it gets repitched on a weekly cadence. And so the first thing that I look at is, is uh, how frequently and how regularly am I going to be able to repitch that yeast and keep momentum going, kind of like a biological momentum, if you will, because it certainly makes a difference. If you pitch a yeast into a beer and then you maybe wait 10 days or 14 days before you repitch it, you may have gone way past any kind of terminal gravity and to the point where the yeast's health is really, really suffering. We've certainly seen that before more often with lager fermentations where we're not brewing them as frequently, but frequency is the first thing that I look at. Uh, what is, then the, uh, yeah, what do you, what do you, what's a sense of, uh, you know, what goes wrong? with those when uh when you don't get the rhythm right when you don't get the rhythm right uh a couple things can happen if you if you try and harvest too early you won't have enough cells there uh fermentation won't be complete enough and not enough yeast cells will have either flocculated or you know really dropped out of suspension that so your harvest is going to be really poor and not dense enough you won't have the cells for the next fermentation uh, the other thing that you look at if you wait too long before harvesting and repitching is uh, viability and vitality both decrease. The amount of healthy cells that you have and the general overall health of those cells diminishes with every day that passes. So um, cadence is, is super important. And then also looking at uh, volume of yeast, making sure that at least in a production environment, that at least once a week, I'm brewing a batch of beer large enough to supply all of the batches the following week. So volume is another thing too. And um, most of the fermenters at our production facility are 45 barrel fermenters. And in general, um, I will get enough yeast off of one 45 barrel fermentation to, to pitch into anywhere from five to 10 45 barrel fermentations the next week. So as long as I have one large batch of beer you know, kind of at the beginning of each week, I know I'm good for the next week. And then also looking at how many generations you're carrying the yeast, because you start getting further along and, uh, things like bud scarring become more of a significant issue. The chance for mutation or mutations, uh, becomes more likely and the characteristic and reliability predictability of the yeast starts to diminish, uh, once you get too many generations in. And so for us, we play it fairly safe and we usually prop up uh, a new pitch every six to sometimes 10 generations, six on the, on the early side, 10 on the latter side. And then another thing that I look at too, is what is the strength of beer that I'm repitching into? What is the strength of the beer that I'm going to be depending on to harvest from? And there are certain styles of beer, certain alcohol percentages where we know the yeast is going to be terminal, where we know we're not going to harvest from that that type of beer. And there are also certain high alcohol styles that we aim to go in at a very specific generation because we just observationally and kind of, uh, you know, qualitatively, we've observed that maybe third or fourth generation is the strongest and most apt to reliably ferment a barley wine or a triple IPA, for example. But those are a couple common things that we look at, but in the production environment, repitching frequency is the first thing I look at. Yeah. Garrison, talk to us about the, the Russian river approach there and how you set up these, uh, you know, successful fermentations. 
Well, I think uh, Julian really had it, hit the nail on the head as far as just that that cadence in the brewery. Uh, you know, we I, I hear a lot of similar practices, and though we're we're really looking at Gen six, we want to get something else into the propagator, um, just so that when we do step up to say our single batch tanks of seventy five barrels, we we know that we're going to have three hundred barrels worth of yeast by the time we get the Gen eight Gen nine. Um, so re- love all that, um, but for, for us, you know, obviously. Uh, well, we'll just start in the brew house, you know, I think, uh, you know, good clean wort is, is, is a big part of it. You know, we want to make sure we have kettle findings in a place that's going to separate all those, you know, heavy molecular rate proteins, polyphenols, and make sure that we have good clear wort going into the fermenter. Um, pH, aeration, pitching rate, I'm not saying anything near there. Uh, um, and, you know, I think, you know, part of the conversation today, and I'm really interested to get, you know, Dr. White and Julian's take on uh, zinc. I think Julie and I had a phone call a couple months back. Uh, zinc's a hard one for craft brewers. It's a it's a hard one. Well, tell us tell us more about that uh, zinc. It sounds like uh, you know such an easy supplement that I just you know take a pill for to um, you know keep my my body health uh, rolling correctly. What uh, um, talk to me about what this focus on zinc is? How what it means? You know what what it means when it's deficient. Um, what, what the negative effects of that and how you all, you know, then use zinc through the fermentation process to, to ensure healthier fermentations. As we slowly started to learn more, you know, we knew we didn't need this, you know, full spectrum yeast nutrient anymore. Um, in, in the day of IPA and high fan malts and all malt brewing, you know, we didn't need a lot of the other things that were coming in yeast nutrition. So we stripped it down and we see more and more craft brewers, you know, moving to, uh, you know, usually like a zinc sulfate. Um, so with that, you're adding a whole heck of a lot less and we can't measure it, right? Um, you know, ASPC methods for measuring zinc in solution are uh, pretty pricey. You know, it's an ICP machine. It's atomic spec. It's it's a um, very expensive analysis and not practical for a craft brewer to really measure in the brewery. So um, it's, it's hard, you know, I think if we were tackling any problem and say, hey, measure first, um, when we don't have the ability to measure, we have to kind of look elsewhere, use other tools, use the literature, um, look at folks like White Labs that can 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 perform this analysis for us and and, and get their guidance on how we dose. Yeah, and I I, I will say that uh, yeah, zinc is more or less the only nutrient that we use in the brewery these days, unless we're doing something uh, that is very very adjunct heavy or might be low in barley malt, like a half of eisen. Uh, in that case, we do use a little bit of yeast X because the fan levels are just not quite there with uh, a grist that's 60% wheat malt. But in general, it, at my production facility, I'd say 99% of what we do, zinc is the only nutrient that goes in there. And kind of, uh, we, we've been using zinc for several years on, on the hot side. And it was really kind of through using a couple different lager strains and seeing some inconsistencies in fermentation uh, and really kind of stripping things down and changing the malt like that beer flavor didn't go away, changing the hops, are we getting hops? Anyway, seeing some recurring flavors that I was becoming acutely aware of and not liking and then also tasting those same flavors in other people's beers with similar yeast and processes and, and thinking, well, you know what? Like we haven't really haven't done a deep dive on zinc and and how we're dosing it. And um, we kind of tore up the blueprint for how we were dosing zinc based on conversations with White Labs and then Garrison and then a couple other large breweries um, uh, who've who've invested in a lot of lab work quantifying these things like Sierra Nevada, New Belgium, having conversations with them about how they dose zinc. But we completely retooled our zinc dosing. It's now all done on the cold side. Mm. Uh, we don't administer it quite the same as Russian River does. But one thing that we're doing now is I bought a, a really large instant pop, which is basically an autoclave, and a whole bunch of autoclavable um, half pint bottles, uh, laboratory autoclave bottles. And I pre mix the solution in acidified water so the zinc dissolves really well. And then I can batch those and make, make like, a week or a week and a half's worth of zinc dosing solutions all at once. And my guys can just grab that, pour it in the top of the fermenter uh, or through an accessory port and that's it. Like it's ready to go. A lot of people can do this very easily in advance. How do you all do it, Garrison? 
Yeah, we're, you know, very similar as far as batching, you know, one liter autoclavable jugs, um, little RO water. We found when we uh, first introduced it with just our, our typical HLT water, we, you know, we thought what we saw was a little bit of chelation and saw some sedimentation. So we uh, went to RO, we got it, got it in solution a little bit better, autoclaved it. Um, and we probably over-engineered it <laughs> a little bit, but, um, you know, what, what we have right now is actually a, a three liter um sorry, three-inch sight glass with a couple of valves. And um, we hooked that up to a peristaltic pump and actually dooms right in line um, on the cold board side. So, um, oh, that's smart. You know, that makes sense. Eh, maybe unnecessary, but uh, we we, had, we enjoyed coming up with that solution and been really happy with the results. Um, I mean, just as far as looking at those rates and talking about all the loss on the hot side, uh, you know, I think Julian, Julian and Russia never make very... Uh, heavily hopped gears. And so uh, just the amount of loss you can get on the hot side near 40 to 60% in literature as far as, you know, what you're losing just to that true pile before you actually get in the fermenter. And so apropos to that, um, when I talk to Sierra Nevada about dosing zinc, they do, they do still perform it on the hot side. I hope I'm not giving away any trade secrets. They still perform it on the hot side, but they have a very extensive lab and they've correlated the losses that they regularly see on average in wort and they compensate for that. And that works for them. Uh, and I'm Chris, I'm sure you can attest to the fact that zinc rates while there, yeah, there is a general range. Some yeast are way more sens sensitive to zinc levels than others. And some benefit quite a bit more. Um, I read in a couple places in some older publications that lager yeast requires half the zinc of ale yeast, but that wasn't really substantiated by anything or uh, there wasn't any supporting hypothesis. Like it requires less because of this biological reason. We found the opposite. We found that our lager strains are much more sensitive to uh, zinc deficiencies. And we, we have to hit that certain level. Like I don't worry if I left out zinc entirely, I wouldn't worry about getting a clean beer out of certain ale yeast. It might not land in exactly the place that I want, but I wouldn't be overly concerned with it. With a lager strain, if we left out zinc, I'd be like, it's anybody's guess as to where this one ends up. Yeah. It's a fascinating topic. I, I mean, I could talk forever. I'd love that these guys are really dialed in uh, because it has an impact on their beers. Um, look, most craft brewers are doing anything with zinc and and you don't have to to make beer. That's the important thing, right? You don't have to with fermentation. So many of the things we could talk about fermentation, you don't have to. But if you want to make, try to make some of the world's greatest beers, this is what makes the difference. Um, this is what makes a difference in fermentation, yeast health, uh, flavor, flocculation. Um, but if you don't, your fermentations look okay. Uh, as mentioned, it's really hard to measure zinc. Uh, and for most of brewing's history, you couldn't. So when you can't measure something, it's very hard to control something. So everybody talked about pitching rate. Okay, that's cool. You can measure that. But uh, it turns out that zinc and oxygen levels are very much harder to measure have a huge impact on how the yeast grow. It's not just what you add, the yeast has to grow. That's where the flavors come from. That's where beer comes from, yeast growth. Uh, so these kind of details are are really important if you want to just move beyond, you know, good beer to great beer. And also, you know, remove some of those little problems that happen once in a while, which do cost you money. Uh, because when you have better fermentations, you have less uh, troubleshooting to do for problem fermentations. So it's not as a new topic. Um, when I started you know like i said going to meetings and stuff 30 years ago the old timers were talking about hey the secret you know to fixing fermentation problems was a little zinc powder um and then i had a talk with uh you know the famous dr michael lewis right most people know him from the first uc davis brewing professor still in davis and uh, uh retired right of course but uh anyway 1963 right coming on to uc davis uh as a brewing professor and we had a talk in the 90s uh, or early 2000s uh, when we were uh, working on zinc that he, he said something very interesting. 
why does zinc addition make a difference? There should be enough zinc from the malt, right? We're going back to these numbers, you know, what's supplied by the malt. So why is it making a difference? He said something very smart. He said, it must be deficient, but we don't know why, because it wouldn't be making a difference in fermentation. So, you know, been worked on for a long time. And and then, you know, with dry hop beers and, and hop creep uh, being a bigger factor with all these tremendous amounts of hops used, it's have a resurgence of interest because it can reduce hop creep time uh, because yeast are more healthy. Uh, they're doing everything better. And I guess just sort of one more story in the, interrelated here is um, after Jamil Zanishev and I wrote that yeast book back in 2010, he started Heretic Brewery. And after a couple of years, they were having some fermentation problems. And his brewers were like, oh, this, that, this. He said, let's just focus on the fundamentals we just wrote about. So they dialed in their oxygen uh, concentration. And this was before we were measuring zinc. So a heretic was next to Anheuser-Busch in Fairfield. They ha- they nicely measured his, the zinc form. And it was zero. And they were, me- they were adding zinc. Uh, they were adding nutrients in, uh, you know, in the whirlpool, in the into boil, whirlpool, like people do, on uh, just wasting their money. And they thought, oh, okay, let's add on the cold side. And other people were talking about it too. And so the next time I went back to Heretic uh, to visit, the, the brewers were almost laughing and giddy at how great everything was going. Their oxygen was right. Their zinc was right. And now, you know, they had just made a 12% um, uh, barley wine with California ale yeast and just saying how clean it was and how all those little fermentation problems went away. But these were things that were hard to fix before if you didn't know they needed to be dialed in. Uh, so Heretic did the same thing, started autoclaving, uh, sterile, uh, autoclaving a zinc solution, stock solution to make it sterile, adding it in with the yeast pitch and seeing really f- quick results. That's exactly why we did Servomyces over, you know, in the early 2000s, over 20 years ago with Lalamon, because to, to, in order to protect zinc uh, from the hot side into the cold side. We just never thought of adding it on the cold side back then, I guess. So for Julie, yeah, Julian, I'm curious about that. Like why, obviously going through this autoclave process to, to make sure that you're, you know, uh, putting in uh, uh, clean and um, zinc into your cold side. Like it seems like that's a more difficult process, obviously, than adding it hot side where that, that he is going to uh, uh, sterilize it. Um, and obviously there's some mix, but it's curious. I mean, how fast does the zinc degrade under that heat? And, uh, um, it does still apparently work on a Sierra Nevada side. Why, why go to this cold side trouble that you do? No, it's I know, not, I'm it's, sure you've done it both ways. Sure. Uh, I, you look at me. I, of course yeah. I've done it both ways. Uh, oh wait, that's not a Friday night confession, by the way. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's not that zinc gets destroyed on the hot side. It's that zinc gets bound up in tube proteins and solid matter that settles in the whirlpool before the wort is transferred to the fermenter. So it, it gets bound up in, in basically stuff that you're going to dump. And uh, on average, I think most studies show that roughly 60% of the zinc that you add on the hot side gets bound up in the tube. Yeah, you can compensate for that up front. Uh, however... I still think, you know, I, I, I still think it's, it's, a, it's a much more efficient pathway. I'm hypothesizing a little bit here. But when you add it on the, the cold side, when you've separated nearly all of that troop or effectively all of it, uh, I think it, it creates a much more efficient pathway for that zinc uh, to go into solution and to make its way to the yeast in, uh, in short order. And it's really not that much extra work. It's, it's, it takes me maybe 15, 20 minutes to batch these things once a week. Uh, it's really no extra time for my brewers. It's it's putting a valve on a tank and an elbow and pouring stuff in, or they get up on top of a fermenter and add it. We don't add it directly to the brink. Um, I'm not sure I would want to risk any kind of overexposure or toxic exposure adding it directly to the yeast, even if we immediately get it injected and homogenized with the beer. Um but adding it on the cold side is not not really a big deal. And then the other time when we do add it on the hot side is when we do uh, high gravity brewing. Uh, so for example, one of our year round loggers, uh, we do two turns of high gravity wort 
those go to the fermenter and then our whirlpool tank gets filled with hot liquor just hot water it's at sterilization temps in those instances we will add it directly to what we call a water back because it's not going to get bound up in any tube or solid matter and that we're confident efficiently makes its way into the fermenter in the full predicted dose that we're looking for Sure. So, Garrison, Garrison Julian mentioned that, uh, you know, lager counter to the conventional logic is a uh, important style to focus on that. You know, you all brew a range of styles from Belgian styles to, uh, uh, you know, to IPA, of course, and lager as well. Do you find that there are specific styles that you uh, alter dosage on or, you know, somehow, you know, very amplify or even dial back uh, where it's less necessary? Or are there other kind of recipe parameters that drive the way that you uh, you think about those zinc additions? Uh, well, I'll say one thing. I think I think we got lucky. Um, we, we kind of had some base rates. And when we made that conversion hot side to cooled side, I didn't touch them. I, you know, I redid the map. Uh, I said, okay, well, if at anything, I'm going to go from 0.15 ppm to 0.25 ppm. And by, by all intensive measurements and literature, that's going to be a good thing. We saw fermentation performance improve. Uh, so we did try to quantify it. I think it's inherently hard to try uh, to, to measure what you actually add to the wort and what you actually get to the fermenter because there can't be yeast present. You have to have these kind of specialized water samples sent off, you know. So uh, it's inherently hard to measure that and feel very, very good that it's homogenous. Um, so we kept things the same um, and we monitored just our process. Uh, uh, Joe, Joe Hertrick said it on an NBA podcast and he's like, you know, I, I could look at a mold COA and, you know, 140 uh, beta glucan may mean something to one person, but if it works in my process, then it works. And, you know, just more off, more just look at the things in your process that you are familiar with how they perform. And so we made that dosage, we, we monitored the performance of the process and, and felt good with it. Um, take that to the logger side. Um, we started to see some, what we thought were symptoms of, of over adding zinc. Uh, you know, so the literature says, you know, stuff about having very concrete type slurries on the bottom of your tank. So we got our yeast slurry back into the brink and instead of being you know, in the one to 1.4 billion cells per mil, we were in two, three billion cells per mil. And it was very concrete. We couldn't, we could barely move it with a positive displacement pump. Uh, so we we're like, ah, maybe, maybe we overdid it. Uh, and so we just backed it off just a little bit and watched again. Um, and when we're talking about these additions, we're talking half a gram to a 75 barrel batch of beer. Um, so you just have to know that these numbers are super, super tiny and it doesn't take much. And, um, when we are measuring this, this bare bone nutrient at a, uh, no five to seven gram amount in a 75 barrel batch of beer, it's, uh, it's quite a bit. So I just have to be conscious and just watch. Very, very small numbers have huge impacts. Wow. But some of the tools that we have available to us now are cost almost nothing. Uh, to get a microgram scale 10 years ago, there were only a handful of laboratory supply companies and they were like a thousand bucks a piece. Now you can go on Amazon and get a functionally very great, reliable great microgram yeah. scale for like 10 or 15 bucks. And yeah. it's digital. It comes with a proof weight. Uh, and so we, we find that those are functionally very accurate for the, the zinc dosing that we're doing. You, you doing. So um, scaling things is is pretty easy measuring out your in ingredients and precisely dosing zinc, I think is uh, fairly easy. But as Garrison mentioned, a lot of it is kind of, um, at least our dosing is done uh, from kind of an academic approach. I, when I redid the calculation for how we were going to apply it in our brewery, I did assume a certain amount was coming from uh, the base malt that we were somewhere in the, the uh, 100 parts per billion or 0.1 PPM range. And then I also assumed that the zinc crystals that we were getting were 22% elemental zinc by, by weight. And so I backed in the calculation from there and found that just in the roughest sense, we're adding uh, one gram of zinc in solution for every 10 barrels of beer that we produce is, is kind of the rough translation of that uh, to get us to 0.3 parts per million or 300 parts per billion 
is kind of the generally accepted sweet spot for most beers. Uh, but what I will say is you can make a really, really good economic argument for this too, in that uh, we always had highly attenuated uh, West Coast IPAs at Beechwood. Um, before we changed our zinc program, uh, we were seeing 87 to 88% attenuation on all malt beers. This is purely silo malt. We're mashing on the cool side, but we've got very healthy Cal Ale. Uh, everything else being equal and just changing the zinc dosing that we're doing, we're now seeing 91 to 93% atten apparent attenuation on all malt beers. And so we were able to back off our base malt um, like seven, eight percent. That's a huge savings over the year, especially the bigger your brewery is. I mean, that could, that in and of itself could amount to tens of thousands of dollars in annual savings. Uh, you know, for, for my brewery, those savings are, are really significant. The, the question I have, when you say that you're increasing performance, what do you define as that performance of, of a fermentation? You know, what are some of those kinds of, uh, you know, key, numbers uh you know key performance indicators that uh you know that you're looking for you know that would define success or less success well ultimately does the beer taste good and is it sure is sure. it clean and aromatic that would be the number that's one that's not uh, quantifiable though julian come on we need some numbers and data okay. Quanti <laughs> okay quantifiably what do we look for we look for shorter lag time in other words the fermentation is is uh apparently active sooner uh, we see terminal gravity sooner. We see a more complete fermentation. Uh, we see a denser harvest at, at time of harvest, and we also see increased viability at time of harvest. So those are, those are measurable things that you need very few tools to kind of quantify and get a general sense of. I think one of the biggest faults people, you know, you'd find, you know, in competitions or beer festivals or, you know, just with craft beer in general, you know, between the okay, you know, beers, good beers, great beers is, is under attenuated. So I think Julian hit it right there. It's like one of the parameters is seeing that attenuation change. I mean, one of the things zinc does is increase maltose and maltose trias uptake. Uh, so, you know, you get more of those carbohydrates in the cell, you get zinc working uh, as a, uh, with the metalloenzymes to do those reactions better. You're going to have more complete reactions driving the chemistry towards finish. Um, and uh, the, the trick, though, you know, is not just adding it, but that zinc has got to get to a cell and then inside the cell. So that's why adding it after the tube removals is, is helpful because uh, chelation is what happens to, to metals with, with protein. And what you're doing is removing protein in the, in the tube. So kind of naturally, I guess we'd expect that a lot would go away. Now we can measure it. We know that. So... Um, but a lot of things have been measured, difficult to measure in wart because it's so complex. And so that's why it's taken longer too for some things. But so the enzyme, you know, this, this zinc has to find it, it gets itself, has to find an enzyme. And so homogenization, you've heard a couple of times here is so extremely important. Uh, Garrison mentioning adding it in line into the fermenter. That is your best practice, if possible. Same with yeast, getting better distribution. But unlike yeast, enzymes aren't going to grow, right? They, they got to mix. Uh, at least yeast growth gets a population blooming. But with, with zinc, it's just, you know, you, you really got to get that distribution. So, which is something brewers didn't have to think about before, really, because nothing else besides yeast was added on the cold side. But this is just the beginning, I think, of us looking at what we can add on the cold side to improve fermentations. Because the brewing industry is weird that we don't. I mean, it feels normal to us, but everybody doing yeast work, whether it's pharmaceutical or other industries, you're adding all sorts of things on the cold side. But for beer, we care about oxygen. We care about contamination. For historical reasons, very important that we have just not done that. But there are huge benefits if it can be figured out. And so that's what we're seeing right now. But the, the homogenization is going to be the key to for any enzymes and nutrients on the cold side to make sure they um, they work. How do you how do you homogenize, Julian? Uh, obviously, if they're dumping in the tank, do you, are you um, you know fostering movement in that tank for that homogenization in any specific way? Yeah. So our typical practice uh, to fill most of our our forty five barrel barrel fermenters at the production facility, it's three turns on the brew house to fill those. 
a typical practice is, um, and this is all done within, uh, like all of those knockouts happen within an eight hour period. So from the time the first turn goes into so no, fermenting. So no Drauflausen for you, all, all a single day. I, kind of Drauflausen. So, uh, so th- that, that's how we do it. But typically the way it happens, first knockout goes into the tank. Yeast gets uh, injected in line uh, just post heat exchanger. And so that gets homogenized with the first turn in the fermenter. And then when the second turn is going in, that's when we'll add this egg kind of at the beginning of that knockout. So it does homogenize with that. I'm sure the zinc uptake starts happening almost immediately. Uh, and then uh, after that second knockout, the third knockout usually goes in four hours after that. But it's typically it's typically the, the second turn where it goes in. And then if a beer is brewed over multiple days, which sometimes is the case for the sake of yeast growth or just the way that the schedule falls and how we have to stagger brews, um, we might split up that, that yeast or sorry, that zinc dose over, over multiple knockouts. It, it depends on the beer, but most of the time second knockout when the fermenter is getting its, uh, second of three fills. And you're, those yeast are creating some currents within the tank the, by themselves through the, the fermentation process and small heat generation that's also causing, you know, creating some currents that help that homogenization. I'm sure that's a contributing factor, but I think the biggest factor is really just the fact that we're pumping in wort. I mean, that's going to overcome overcome any other kinetics of uh, the yeast that are, that are taking place that early in fermentation. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. And uh, the fact that you have more fills going, right? What I would not want to do, I mean, a lot of people will just add, you know, they'll they'll put their the the fill the fermenter and they'll add on the top uh, through a top manway or something, and that I I would recommend not doing because yes, you're going to get some turbulence in the fermentation, but it's just not enough to distribute that mineral zinc everywhere where it needs to be to get the best practice, best performance. And and Chris, to your point, um, you know, when we do small small batches of beer where there's only a single turn going into, you know, like a 15 or 20 barrel fermenter, uh, we will, will knock at once half of the volume is in the tank. We might drop that zinc solution through the top when we're still very actively, relatively vigorously pumping in words. We do, we're fairly confident we're getting the mixing then of, you know, but. You know, funny story. I've been at a few breweries now, uh, watching this, you know, and seeing what people are doing, even at our own brewery. In Asheville uh, last month, it was there when we were, well, we brewed a, a American light lager and um, we said, okay, what about, uh, it was Bruzine D at that time, but uh, uh, where, where'd that go? Oh, I forgot. So we'll add it in the top. So since we're not used to as an industry, kind of adding these cold side things, it's like, where is everything? And then I was in another brewery and I said, where is it? And they said, oh, it's in the cold room still. Well, they're halfway through the transfer. So it's kind of like assembling these things, getting used to a different kind of practice, um, getting your whole team to be doing it the same way so it doesn't have unpredictable results. Um, it's just going to be a fun thing for us to, to all focus on and look at. This homogenization and circulation within uh, cold side tanks is something that, you know, you hit on at various points of that um, during the fermentation and then after through dry hopping because it's that, you know, getting that kind of contact exposure and homogenization of the tank is important in all of those things. And so I know Russian River, you all have some tank technology that aids in, in that homogenization on the hop side uh, or when you're dry hopping. Do you uh, use any of that for, I mean, if you're in line, you probably don't need to, to focus on mixture as much. Well, I'll say, um, you know, even even at the pub, we, we, we don't have the luxury of those goose mixes you're, you're, you're referring to. And, um, you know, we'll just add one extra tea on the knockout rig. And we're still adding it in line, sight glass, double valve, and a little gas connection. And we can kind of meter that in line with gas and feel, feel, feel fairly confident. Um, the mixer is an interesting point. We've thought of, uh, you know, what sort of creative ways could we, could we use this, you know, portable uh, in-tank mixer. Uh, you know, we've thought about it with uh, hop flowables. We've thought about it with uh, um, with with zinc as well. And, you know, we kind of came up with this pump. We just so happened we had a peristaltic pump laying around. Just so happened we had an extra port in our knockout line. And uh, it kind of came together pretty quickly and pretty pretty low budget. 
Yeah, interesting. Well, Chris, earlier you mentioned uh, you know that this is, these zinc additions obviously promoting greater attenuation through your fermentation um, help knock out some of the issue with hop creep. Um, you know, and I know that uh, you know both Beechwood and Russian River are also using other techniques, uh, you know, specifically enzymes, as a, also a means of uh, controlling and managing this while you know promoting fermentation. Let's let's talk a little bit, uh, you know, about that piece. Um, you know, Julian, how how uh, how then do you all use enzymes within the with the fermentation process to keep these healthy fermentations pushing forward and eliminate some of the you know potentially uh, negative effects of later or lagging fermentation at the very end? Well, I'm I'm or a big fermentation through dry hopping. Yeah. Well, I'm a big fan of uh, of uh, better brewing through science, and we use a whole host of enzymes at the brewery depending on the type of beer that we're brewing. But uh, I would want to clarify that, you know, if you have an unhealthy fermentation from the beginning, you it, it's really, really tough to to kind of fix that, if you will, especially once things are fully attenuated or even halfway attenuated. There are very few levers that you can pull successfully. Um, occasionally they work out, but uh, that's a very long technical conversation. But uh, I think what you're getting at the most is probably the use of ALDC, uh, alpha acetolactate decarboxylase. And that is the enzyme, which if everybody is not using it, I think they should be using it in dry hop beers. Um, there are some genetically modified yeast, uh, yeast strains available that will produce that enzyme, uh, you know, on their own. Uh, but that is the enzyme that helps clear that diacetyl pathway uh, in fermentation, especially during dry hopping when fermentation is really complete and you're depending on just a little bit of healthy yeast still in suspension to complete that um, that hop creep related fermentation when you have those alpha diastase enzymes introduced from the dry hopping uh, itself. And what I, if there are breweries out there that say they don't get hop creep, um, they're either entirely brewing brute IPA or they just, they don't know it. Cause I hop creep happens. Refermentation happens when you dry hop a beer. We have highly attenuated base beers that are completely absent of dextrin malt. They're mashed cool. Uh, it, it's, it's not a very dextrinous word. And, uh, we always see a rise in head pressure after we uh, after we add dry hops and that's not just CO2 coming out of solution. I thought that's what it was for a long time until people discovered hop creep. That's hop creep. That's re-fermentation that's happening. And every hop varietal is different. Um, we have found, uh, certain hop varietals are much more problematic than others. And so for us, we use in any beer that is getting dry hopped, we will not use any dextrin malt. Uh, we always use ALDC, uh, on the higher end of the dosing rate with our yeast. So it gets pitched at the beginning. And then depending on the dry hop, we will also add it with the dry hop. Uh, beers that get brewed with Mosaic, uh, and my brewery will get it with a dry hop. If we dry hop with something like CTZ or Citra, we don't see the same type of hop creep. And, you know, we've demonstrated this many times with uh, lab tests. We don't see that latent diacetyl. So in some of those beers, we don't have to add ALDC with the dry hop. I think it's very um, hop varietal dependent. Um, I think some of it is related to the alpha diastase uh, amounts that are on the hop varietals. And I think I I think some of it's also related to the polyphenol levels in the hops. And I could I can get into that deeper if you want me to. <laughs> Oh, I'm very curious. Strange, strange. <laughs> Are you okay? So uh, I'll I'll answer this one for for Garrison, but um, and I and I posited this hy hypothesis to uh, Tom Shellhammer um, at Oregon State, and then um, uh, Pat Jensen at uh, Yakima Chief Ops a couple years ago. But we have two core West Coast IPAs. We've got Amalgamator, which is all mosaic in the dry hop. And then we've got Citraholic, which is all Citra in the dry hop. And really they're, they're identical beers. It's a great example of what changing one hop varietal will do to the identity and flavor and aroma of a beer, but they're on paper, they're the same beer. Um, but whenever we would see, we would always notice a larger 
head pressure build in a amalgamator with mosaic compared to citraholic uh we would whenever we would send things to the lab um we're usually in detectable levels for our vdk and diacetyl usually our beers are testing sub 15 uh ppb which is functionally indetectable but if we ever did see any kind of like slight rise like maybe 20 or 25 ppb or something at some point in the process it was almost always in amalgamator a uh, mosaic hopped beer and at the same time uh we're a brewery that relies on finings to clarify beer we use you know uh, we use a silica based finding we don't filter we don't use gelatin uh we were noticing that citraholic was requiring twice the amount sometimes three t- times the amount of finings to clarify that beer and i was pretty sure it was related to polyphenol levels and so i had Yakima Chief run polyphenol tests on a whole bunch of our selected lots and then compared with just uh, generic lots that they had on the shelf. But what they found is that almost across the board, Citra had a 30% higher polyphenol level than Mosaic, Simcoe, a lot of other common varietals. And I wondered if the polyphenols were somehow inhibiting that alpha diastase or some of that alpha diastase activity. And I did a little bit of research and lo and behold, um, polyphenols are sometimes given as a diet an oral dietary supplement for diabetics to slow diastase activity in the gut and slow uptake of carbohydrates and, and broken down sugars. And so my hypothesis is that polyphenol content also plays a role in hop creep and latent diacetyl. Interesting. So by, so by inhibiting the, the enzyme reaction. I, I think I think it does inhibit it. And and certainly we know if we know anything about enzymes is that they can be inhibited, whether it's through temperature, whether yep. it's through, uh, you know, a, a, an anti enzyme, uh, you know, something that will will block the enzyme from from latching on to whatever it's trying to cleave. Um, but from a chemistry standpoint, it's certainly certainly possible. And I I think. I think that's what we what we see because we've never seen any latent diacetyl issues in beers that were dry hopped purely with CTZ, uh, purely with Citra. But we've certainly, you know, we've certainly seen it happen with with Mosaic. Garrison, Garrison, what's your experience there? Uh, um, you know, and how do you all manage using um, ALDC or other enzymes uh, through that process to to cut back uh, or to you know fight against uh, hop creep? Uh, we support it. Uh, we're, we're big. We're big enzyme users here as well. Uh, you know, I think it's just another example how modern science has made better beer. Um, and but uh, I will say another parallel, like economic potential of, of really dialing in your zinc is we, you know, we cut our enzyme usage by three hundred percent from an ALDC perspective um, because you know we were in this we had this fermentation deficiency that we felt like was being caused by, you know, lacking yeast nutrients. And, you know, we were looking anywhere from uh, six to eight to nine days warm on hops waiting for this hop creep to finish and the diacetyl reduction to go. So, you know, uh, you know, brewers, that, uh, you know, they just want to throw more at it. So we're just putting more ALDC in the tank. And, uh, you know, we got to this ALDC rate that was, you know, frankly, <laughs> unsustainable. And just through just through zinc usage, we were able to get that fermentation window much further down. And you know, now we're five to six days warm on hops, where we get that same attenuation rate. Um, we are trying to basically build a little bit of dextrin content in our wort so that we know we have a pre-dry hop attenuation target and then a final attenuation target. Because uh, we're trying to keep a little little more body in these beers. I think Southern California is definitely uh, uh, notorious for having you know dry bitter beers. I people love and I love personally, uh, but but that's not always our brand profile. And so, you know, we're targeting 2.4 to 2.6 finishing gravity on Pliny the Elder. Um, so we so we buffer a little bit of dextrin capacity and we change our mash bill to kind of hit that pretty dry hop attenuation. And then we know based off the hop bill what our final attenuation should be. So um, obviously we have to still finish that that fermentation out we have clear vdks we we run vdks both on forest and on gc um so we're waiting for that threshold to drop that gravity drop to you know stop um but yeah through zinc we were able to kind of bring a lot of that down and go from a 
eight days post dry hop to five, six. Like uh, Julian, do you see hop variety impacting, uh, you know, the way that you use enzymes or the way that there are any dosage? Absolutely. Uh, and I think, yeah. And I think the advent of some of these hop products is, is, is a real big deal and concentrated pellets and, you know, there's a lot of studies still ongoing as far as, you know, what part of the plant material is actually, you know, carrying those diastatic enzymes. We found that it was a lot of different places. So, um, you know, but the concentrated pellets, we did find a lot uh, less diastatic reduction. Yep. And, and there have been a couple of breweries that have done studies on this, but the the current studies and indicators point to most of that alpha diastase being bound up in the green matter. Uh, there are a couple of breweries out there that have extensive enough labs and they've done studies where they brewed an IPA purely with cryo hops and measured less alpha diastase, seen less hop creep, seen less VDK. Everything has been diminished. But, you know, I, I think cryo is a, an example of a great product, but I also view it as a supplemental product. And also, if you wanted to just eliminate hop creep by only dry hopping with with cryo that that Tinctures, would get expensive yeah. too yeah, yeah that would get expensive also and i think we know that we have to have like a full spectrum of hop products to create these beers i don't think we can totally you know do eye drop shows of tinctures to, to create this this hop profile and flavor sensation um but yeah we, we i mean we did find just changing varieties out in different formats we saw you know a less uh yeah less you know attenuation change post dry hop so mosaic is a big offender. I, any, I think it is. Are there any others that are like red flag hops where you know you're going to have to put some more work into these? Amarillo, uh, Cascade. <laughs> we, I, I, I want to say this year we're going through maybe 40 pounds of Cascade and only on a like red ale and brown ale. It's not something we typically dry up with anymore. But um, another another enzyme which I I think brewers can use, uh, and they may not necessarily think about. It reducing hop creep, but uh, any type of alpha glucosidase enzyme, we use both of those um, in uh, a lot of our American kind of macro style lagers. And uh, every once in a while, if we will brew like maybe a West Coast style beer, but with a less attenuative yeast, like let's say I want to use an English ale yeast in a West Coast style beer, we will hit the mash with amylo enzyme to ensure that it's as dry as something like Cal Ale. And I think if the drier your beer is, the more attenuated it is, the less likely you are to have issues with Hop Creek because there is less to ferment. Um, and so that's, an, I think, another enzyme that brewers should consider using to ensure a dry beer. And if you're worried about something being overly dry, well, you can make up for some of that by water treatment, you can kind of counteract some of those effects of something being bracingly dry by dialing in your finishing acidity, your finishing chloride levels. And so you have a lot of, a lot of adjustable, uh, dials, but again, um, some type of alpha glucosidase, I think is a, is a good weapon to have. Chris, are you seeing, uh, you know, anything else in that enzyme space that, uh, the brewers are responding to, or are you all, um, you know, how are you all operating in that, in that space? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, we've been working a lot with, uh, enzymes for, uh, brewers before, but also the non-beer industries we work with in distilling and, and wine and, you know, basically all the alcoholic fermented beverages. And, you know, I, like I say, I started so more in enzyme chemistry than anything else. So, um, I, I think they're fascinating and there's a lot that's not supplied in malt, but they're still as natural. Um, so, you know, we're brewers again are used to sort of everything coming in, in the barley, which is pretty awesome. Has to be converted a little bit to malt, malted barley, but, um, we're pretty lucky, but you know, the American light beer category was built on glucoamylase and ours is ultra firm and, and there's others as Julian mentioned, but you know, Miller Lite, that was it, the first American version of that uh, German technology patent that uh, produced a lighter beer because more carbohydrates were consumed, a drier beer. I mean, uh, it was called light beer more because of the calories, but now you can talk about carbohydrates. People have that more in the vocabulary now, which is cool because that's really what matters. Uh, and, and the consumer 
is talking carbohydrates now. It's talking uh, drier. Okay, you can talk carbs or calories; doesn't really matter. But um, it's getting more inter uh, dispersed or inter whenever. But I think that's what's driving a lot of people to these other beverages outside of craft beer. You know, and it's it's not so much price. A lot of them are priced higher, but people, younger consumers, are looking for lower calorie. And if you make them drier, that's that's the biggest thing for lower calorie. I mean, you can always adjust alcohol if you care about the calories there. But um, I think you know that's where these combinations of things might be important. Um, and you know, I, I mentioned that America Light Lager that we just made uh, last month, and we also made in San Diego. You know, we're using Ultra Firm to uh, to make a more fermentable wort and get it under one Play-Doh. Um, and you could water it back if you wanted to a little bit to control the alcohol or use a lighter uh, OG if you wanted to to have a, a lower calorie or lower alcohol beer. Uh, a lot of fun things you could do there that, or you could do the, what Anheuser-Busch did with Bud Light didn't want to do the enzyme. They just did a three-hour mash. I mean, so there are things, they never got it as low as Miller Light, but there are things you can do with enzymes or with our mash profile, like it's not done after an hour, yeah, right? just because the color turns, right? If you ever left a mash going overnight, you know, it ferments a lot more. So that, again, that's where enzymes come in. Like, it, yes, they work fast, but how long do you want them to work? How, how much substrate are they going to find? Uh, so it's a fascinating topic that uh, probably is just getting begin to begin with uh, for some craft brewers and some people have been doing it for a long time. Miss, I have a, a question for you related to ALDC. So, as somebody who lives in California, I love wine. Um, I love all all types and all varietals of wine, but one that I find problematic are a lot of California Chardonnays because they go through this massive malolactic fermentation, and that presents as just huge diacetyl in a lot of these wines. It's why when I gravitate towards a white wine, I, I go for something like a Saab Blanc, which doesn't go through malolactic. But when I looked at the metabolic pathway of the malolactic fermentation, the uptake of diacetyl and the conversion of diacetyl looked almost identical, if not totally identical to Saccharomyces. So could you do a malolactic fermentation with ALDC present and eliminate that diacetyl and still convert the uh, malic acid to lactic acid? Yes, I think so. Um, yeah. I mean, um, no one's really asked me about that before, but can you uh, tell that to all, uh, all the winemakers up in Sonoma and Napa, please? <laughs> Garrison, that's your job now. <laughs> oh. And I, all I the people no crossover, <laughs> come on. <laughs> but uh, maybe they can do it. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. Like it, what what brewers talk about is so departmentalized in brewing, and with our own vocabulary, what winemakers talk about, and our vocabulary is just different enough to make us sound weird talking to the other groups. But, uh, you know, I, I'm certainly saying 30 years ago, but lots of things have already happened between groups now. I'd be curious uh, to see if anybody would be willing to try that at a winery, because there are certainly winemakers out there who do not like malolactic fermentation in their Chardonnays. Um, I, could, I could think of several right now, but it is more common to do malolactic than to not with certain varietals. But I'd be curious to know if anybody would be willing to try it with Hale DC. Interesting, interesting. We're going to build a whole new audience for the podcast here amongst winemakers that want to talk to Julian about fermentation. <laughs> they, Brilliant. They don't Brilliant. want my in, They don't want my input. That guy? Oh my god. <laughs> well, uh, we've been talking for a while here. Let's uh, let's kind of pull out as we finish up. Um, you know, and just kind of bullet point it for folks. Garrison, you know, if if if, pe- if you're thinking about fermentation and takeaway tips that brewers out there listening to this, uh, you know, can focus on, um, you know, what are your top three things that uh, you know that everybody out there listening who's brewing beer should be paying attention to? What are those those three big takeaways that they should take? Yeah, uh, clean wort. You know, look at your kettle findings, making sure you're separating things that should be separated. Um, uh, so I think that's 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 a big thing straight off the top. Um, you know, we're, we're with Chris here, so I, I'm going to say make sure you have good, healthy yeast uh, at the right pitch rate, at the right viability, um, and that I, I, I'll ring one more bell for aeration. Um, I think that's there's a lot of cool cool ways you can uh, optimize a fermentation um, or try to get more or less yeast growth or more or less. Uh, you know, flavor active metabolic um, compounds out of controlling aeration. Julian, what are your top three takeaways? 
Um, I would echo what, what Garrison said. Um, but, uh, I think before you even get to fermentation, uh, you know, figure out what inspires you and go to the source and have those, have those things fresh. Uh, so you have a good sense of, of where the finishing line actually is. You can only brew a style so well by reading about it in the book and, and chances are you'll be way off point. Uh, so you've got to go to the source, uh, to really understand how, how things are. So when you do start, start brewing things in your brewery, you, you understand how close or far away you are from a target. And to Garrison's point, healthy yeast is incredibly good. Uh, clean wort is incredibly important as well, but consider playing around with, uh, enzymes, consider varying oxygen dosing rates on certain styles to control flavor, um, and aroma profile as well as fermentation temperature. Um, I think a lot of people would be surprised where a lot of American macro lagers are fermented and how ester driven a lot of those are. So a lot of things to consider. Interesting. Interesting. Chris, what are your big takeaways for brewers out there looking for healthy fermentations? Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, pitching rates, one of the important elements, but again, thinking about yeast growth, as we were talking about zinc, oxygen, if you can measure the oxygen, try to get closer to one PPM per, um, per Play-Doh, uh, in zinc. And, um, I'm sorry, we were just talking about oxygen, you know, rather than just a seven or a 10 or flow rate. Um, and, and, uh, those are important and thinking about how attenuative your beer wants to be. You know, if, if we keep, if people keep complaining that the beers that aren't good are under attenuated, what, what are, what can be done, you know, especially without equipment. Um, first of all, sometimes it's knowing that they're supposed to be fermented drier. Like, you know, I think of the Belgian beers that we started making in the U S and they taste fruity and they taste sweet. So people made them sweet, but, you know, if you feel to Belgium and, you know, as people are doing, you visit the source, you know, you're like, well, these are pretty darn dry, but they're fruity. That tastes sweet. You know, make fermentation, create the flavors. Uh, don't just make it sweeter. That's not what most consumers want today. Um, and when they find out that, you know, that, you know, the, 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 again, coming back to the dryness and, you know, it's been a big topic for me most of my life. I'm a type one diabetic and I've always had to think about carbohydrates and sugar. Uh, and I don't even like the word carbohydrates. I think it's a stupid word. People don't know what sugar. It doesn't matter what carbohydrate it is. It's sugar in our body in 20 minutes. Uh, so <laughs> big deal. It didn't take five minutes. Uh, but we have amylase enzymes. We have everything to make uh, in our mouth. You know, so we have everything to break these things down. Plus all the microbes in our body. So beer just lives in this world, and consumers are getting smart uh, about what they're they're drinking. And so a better fermentation makes a drier product, gives you more metals at GABF because that's what wins. <laughs> I mean, it's, it goes on and on and on, but because uh, then the flavor shines through of your hops, of your malt, of your fermentation. Don't just make it sweeter. Make, you know, focus on that flavor. I think those are great words to wrap this up with. Uh, thanks for joining all of us on this special fermentation-focused episode of the podcast. Again, brought to you interruption-free by our friends at White Labs. Visit whitelabs.com for more information. And if you've got a particular fermentation problem that you're trying to solve, uh, reach out because Chris's experts there at White Labs can help craft a solution for you. Um, Chris, Julian Garrison, thanks. Thanks to all of you for joining your thoughts on fermentation and yeast health. It has been fantastic talking with you. Cheers. It's been an honor. Thank you, Jamie, Chris, Thank Garrison. You. Oh, oh man, that's a lot of fun. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, everybody. This podcast has been brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those who love to make and drink great beer. To learn more or to subscribe, visit beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. 